And you, viewers, we are now getting ready to share our message. And we welcome all the Facebook and YouTube viewers. And uh, what a blessing to have all of you here, all of us together. We're going to be sharing another message on our, um, what we're calling the Garden of Faith. And it's John 15, 1 through 8. John 15, 1 through 8. Real or carnal? And Jesus said these words, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while each branch that does not bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into a fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and I will, get, will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. A lady that worked for the elementary school, it was a small school district, and she had a huge garden at home. And she had great pride in it. And she would bring vegetables, fruits and vegetables from her garden to feed there at the school. And she had great pride that those kids had a good, balanced meal with wonderful, fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, one day, the uh, electricity went off and she wasn't able to uh, fix those, so she fixed peanut butter and jelly. The very first little boy that comes through the line and says, Hallelujah, finally a home-cooked meal. <laughs> Not everybody appreciates the things that we have in God. You and I are talking about a garden. It's actually a garden of faith. Not everybody is going to appreciate it. But you and I do it because God does. Gardening your faith. It's a very important part of our spiritual lives. Gardening your faith. Sometimes we need to have a fruit inspector. There's all kinds of inspectors in our uh, fruits and our vegetables and our meats and all of those things. They look for any kind of things that are dangerous or wrong. And we need to do the same thing with our own lives. We should have fruit inspecting of our own lives to see if we are spiritually real. Jesus said that you can judge the quality of a person's spiritual life by the fruit that it produces. So that's what we're going to be talking today about, is the fruit that we produce. So the first thing we see here is bearing fruit for Jesus Christ. Fruitfulness, number one, is very important to God. It is a very important subject to God. We can see that because you and I read about eight verses, either three or four times, God said, if you remain in me, you will produce fruit. If you remain in me, if you remain in me, and I in you, you will produce fruit. How many times did that say that in those eight verses? It's important to God. What kind of fruit we produce? So let's look at the first one. A. Fruitfulness is the mark of your genuineness as a believer. Just how deep a Christian we are, how true a Christian we are, 
is going to show through, if you will. It's going to show through. Faithfulness is a mark of whether a person is genuinely born again or not. Am I really born again? Have I changed? Is my life different than it was back a few years ago or whatever it might be? So let's look at Matthew 7, 15 through 17. Jesus gives a stern warning in this verse. He says, watch out. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do not pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. That which our lives produce is an indication of what kind of lives we possess. We talked about that at length last week. Who you are, we said last week, who you are is going to determine what you believe and it's going to determine what you do. And that's what we're talking about again today. A person who claims to be a Christian but lives their life like everyone else, there's no evidence of change. We also talked last week that if we're going to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's going to have to be some changes. If there's no changes in the lives of us, then we have to ask how good our fruit is. Last week we talked about if a person claims to be a Christian but believes that his life is for, for himself and not everyone else, then he's probably a person that's self-centered. It's me, me, me. A person that wants for myself. That's the type of person that person is. Self-centered. And wanting just for me. If you're a person that, that believes that money makes the world go around, well, those are going to be evidences in the way he lives. The best boats, the best cars, the best clothes for the kids, best everything, because money is what he believes is the best thing. If someone doesn't believe that there's a, a heaven or an earth or a hell, and that this life is ended, as soon as we take that last breath, you're going to see by the way they live their lives. It's going to be for now. You won't be seeing them serving at the nursing homes, doing things for other people. Salvation is not reforming your old self, but it's transforming you into a new life. It's not just knocking off the edges of the old you so you can go on with, with most everything that you're doing. It's a change. A genuine believer has been conformed and over time to the image of Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. Crops don't grow overnight. You can't plant seeds and get up in the morning and find a crop. You can't accept Jesus Christ and in the morning find out that you're a mature Christian. It has to be grown. B, fruitfulness is the measure of your walk. It's the measure of your walk with the Lord. How big of steps are you taking with Christ? As of the game we used to play, are they little baby steps or the great big giant steps? Little boys and little children will get their moms and dads great big shoes and they'll, and they'll put their feet in there and they'll be trying to walk in those big shoes. Why? Because they admire their daddy. They want to be grown up and big like their daddy and their mamas. Are you taking and trying to fill the steps of God? You've got some big shoes to fill with Jesus Christ. But he wants us to try to be as Christ-like as possible. Taking big steps of trying to be Christ-like. And it's the same way as the gardener. You and I can relate to this in terms of a garden. We go out and we plant seeds. We have every good intention to grow a big garden. 
We get those seeds in there and we fertilize her, and the next thing we know that we've forgotten about the garden. Life has gotten too busy. There's too many other things going on, and the weeds take over. Our fruit will be very small. And then you might be what I used to do. I was real good at first, and I dug the weeds. I treated, I got things out of it. I did it okay for a little while, and then all of a sudden the weeds took over. I had a harvest, but it wasn't real good, and I had to fight the weeds to find it. Did you ever have to do that? Fight, <laughs> fight the weeds to find the crop? But then there's the third one. The one that spends much time in his garden. It's a beautiful garden, but it takes a lot of effort. It produces luscious, bountiful harvests, all kinds of beautiful things to eat and to enjoy. But it took time. It took work. In John 15, verses 2, 5, and 8, Jesus mentions those three different levels of faithfulness and spiritual fruitfulness. A little fruit some fruit, and then those people that have huge amounts of fruit that, that they can see from, from the Christ in their lives. It's so huge, you say, how do they have the time to do it all? That's the kind that he wants us all to have, where people will wonder, where do they find their time and energy? What do people see? in terms of fruit bearing in our lives? That's one of your questions. What do people see in terms of fruit bearing in your life? See, fruitfulness is the motivation behind God's discipline. There's a principle that applies to every genuine believer and it's called pruning. We know if you have grown grapes before that after the harvest you have to take and you have to clean out all the dead branches. You clean them all out so the new branches will come back stronger and be able to provide a fuller crop. Look at John 15 2 that we just read. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You and I may go through some pruning. It's nothing that God does to us because he's mean. He does it so that we will spend our energy and our efforts not on things that's unproductive, but things that are productive. Many times I've had plans. There's an old saying, if you want God to laugh, just tell him your plans. But I've had plans that, that sometimes weren't God's plans. But as I tell people, take one step at a time, and if it doesn't work out, you know it wasn't God's plan. But many times I've taken steps toward some sort of ministry or something that I thought I, I wanted to do or should do, and it didn't work out. It's not God being mean to me, but I've learned over the years that he had something better for me to do. To bear more fruit. Every time my plans fail, I know God is redirecting me to something better. Now let's look at D. Fruitfulness is the method of touching other people. Boy, that's a good one. Fruitfulness is the method of touching other people. Fruit bearing is not about us, it's about others. Have you thought about that? The spiritual fruit that we've talked about from Galatians. But let's look at this one, Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're going to benefit from those things too, aren't we? But boy, the people around us, <laughs> they're going to benefit, aren't they? From gentleness and self-control? 
My family's still waiting for me to do those things. <laughs> and they will. They will receive good things from what I do. Love and joy and peace, gentleness and self-control. The people around us will benefit from those things. There's a story about a lady that wanted to take a first aid class. She thought maybe she could either help others, maybe. She took the class, and sure enough, right in front of her street, right in front of her house, was a terrible accident. And it was a bad one. And she went running out there to see if she could help, and she saw all the, the pain and all the blood and all the bad things, and she got faint. She remembered in her class what to do. So she kneeled down and put her head between her, uh, between her legs, and, and she made it through. <laughs> she forgot the whole reason for taking the class. She didn't help others. She just helped herself. We learn those things, too, the hard way. The Holy Spirit is in us. And yes, all those things I mentioned a while ago, the loving and caring, all those things are wonderful for us. But the good things inside of us will seep out. And they will be enjoyed by many, many people. E. Fruitfulness is the manifestation of Christ in the world. The manifestation of Christ in the world. I love that world manifestation. It comes from the word manifest. If you were truck drivers or something like that, you know that you have a manifest, and that tells you what's in your load. And that's what manifest means. It is, the, what, it is made clearly seen. That's what it means. Jesus Christ was on this earth for three years, and we could see it then because those of those who were there because we saw him. But now it's different, isn't it? God has to be, Jesus Christ has to be seen through us. Galatians 2.20, look at what it says. Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who lives, but it is Christ who lives in who? Who lives in me. That's how we see Christ now. Through the lives of other people, through the lives of Christians, through us. And that's why the New Testament continuously says the body of Christ. The body, we are the body of Christ. He is the head, and we are the body of Christ. Here's your question. We, the church, are his body, his hands, and his feet. Last one. Fruitfulness is the means of glorifying God. Fruitfulness is the means of glorifying God. How many times have we read that we are to glorify God? And this is probably the last verse, is probably the most powerful verse. John 15, 8. 15, 8. This is to be my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. We hear that all the time, don't we? We're to glorify God. What does that really mean, to glorify God? Well, we can really get a good example from our own children. You take your kids and send them off to church camp or some other camp or some other thing, maybe even just a day or two, and the family or the parents of those of, of the other kids that they were visiting comes and says, oh, what a wonderful child you have. <laughs> he was so respectful and he was so helpful and volunteered to help in doing everything. He was kind and courteous to the other kids. And you go, wait a minute. <laughs> My kid's a little blonde with glasses. She says, no, I know, I know. He was just wonderful. And he's doing all the things that you tell him to do, but he won't do it at home. That glorifies you. It's it swell up like a beam, the parents did. Evidently, he's heard after, <laughs> after all. But see, it glorifies you because he's now a reflection of you. 
and it makes you proud. It's the same way with God. You are the children of God. When you live the life that he wants you to live, you forgive when you don't want to forgive. When you trust, when you don't really know if you can trust or not. If you do the things that's hard to do and the rest of the world's not doing it, but you do it because God tells you to do it, God smiles. And you're glorifying him because you are a reflection of who? Jesus Christ. And God smiles. And God smiles. The more we live like Christ, the more we glorify God. The more we live like Christ, the more we glorify God. Because we are his children. And he loves each and every one of us. Oftentimes, we'll take a trip to an orchard in the summertime or fall. We see what looks like a peach tree in the distance, so we go over there to the peach trees. It looks like a peach tree. It has the bark of a peach tree. It has the leaf of a peach tree, but there's an apple thrown on it. <laughs> Actually, that is possible nowadays. That can happen. Fruit Breeders can do amazing things with grafting and all that stuff. In fact, several years ago, Ruth and I, quite a few years ago, we bought a rose bush. She was so excited. A special rose bush. I don't know if it was a tea, tea rose or what it was. But she was so excited. And we planted it, and that first year it had beautiful roses. But that winter it died. And I was thinking that next spring to dig it all up, but... It was coming back up from the roots. So we saved it. Guess what it was from the roots? Multiflora rose, like you get right out of the woods. Stickies and brushy and... You see, the roots were not real. The roots were of something else. And as you and I want to be a gardener and we want to have faith of Christ, we have to have the roots of God that will produce the fruit that we want to have. But we have to read the Word. We have to be there. And if God has established our lives, as we have studied last week, the who we are, who we are is a born-again Christian saved by grace, a follower of Jesus Christ. If we are grounded there, we will bear much fruit. Good fruit, beautiful fruit, lots of fruit, and the fruit that looks like Jesus Christ, which glorifies the Father in heaven. Maybe sometimes we need to be a fruit inspector, not so much of other people, but of ourselves. And just ask ourselves, are we rooted and built up in Jesus Christ? Our closing scripture is Colossians 2, 7. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as we were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Amen and amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, was the perfect example. We thank you, O Lord, for giving us the opportunity to be Christ-like. But it's so hard for us, and you know what it is, Lord, for us to struggle with those things. And we ask that you be in us. Give us the peace, the joy, and the hope and the strength and the faithfulness to be as Christ-like as possible in our lives. Putting away the other things, folding up the old me, and only opening up the new me, the me that's in Christ Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.
Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 489, The Banner of the Cross. Anyone who'd like to join our church or dedicate their lives to Christ may come forward during this hymn. The Banner of the Cross, 489. We'll sing the first and last verse as we stand.